Around the world, millions of people move to cities each year, but with that influx comes problems associated with poverty and economic disparity. City University New York scholar Benjamin Barber explores the plight of cities, and he's here with us tonight to tell us about the ingredients needed for the rejuvenation. So from New York, New York, we welcome back Benjamin Barber. He's also the author of If Mayors Ruled the World. Hello again. Nice to have you back this evening. Very nice to be back tonight. Okay, so yesterday we talked about whether cities are better than nation states at governing, which you made a very good case uh, for. Uh, tonight I want to fo start focusing on the economic challenges cities face. Many, many cities reliant on the state or province uh, for, for funding. We've seen cities like Detroit declare bankruptcy. How can cities, Benjamin Barber, uh, take on a greater leadership role when they're under such financial limitations, such so financially constrained? Well, let's back up for a second on that question and remember a simple statistic. Cities around the world produce 80% of gross national, gross domestic product. They are the creators of wealth in our society. And if they're short on resources, it's not because they don't produce those resources, it's because those resources have been taken away from them to be used for other things. So the issue isn't one of wealth production, but wealth distribution, jurisdiction. And the reality is <clears throat> that cities are the primary source of taxation for provinces, for states, and for nations. And quite properly, they help support all of the activities, whether it's uh, national environmental concerns, national parks, national navies and armies, the national bureaucracy, and so forth. They help support that. But what's happened in recent years is that in taxing them, we have taken away from them the resources they need as they increase their uh, role in solving problems that the state once solved. So I don't want to say it's the state's job to give them resources. It's the state's responsibility to let them hold on to a greater portion of the resources that they generate so that they can solve the problems. Because what's happening today is a lot of nation states are saying to cities, okay, you do this, you deal with education, you deal with climate change, but they're giving them no, none of their own funding back. And that makes for what we call in social science an unfunded mandate. Mm. Do this, but there's no money for it. Okay, this is a, a debate that we have in our cities, in, in our country, uh, with our uh, provinces. So if, if the argument is, is hey, city, let the cities hold on to the monies that they have in their wallets. Is there an argument that um, some sort of governance structure or institutions like the IMF or, or, or the World Bank on a city's level would be worthwhile? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, it would be very helpful to have more intercity cooperation around financing. That's for sure. And it may be that there would be some institutions like that would be helpful. But the other thing that we need to do is think a little bit about the jurisdictional boundaries, the frontiers, the city limits of cities. Most cities in North America were defined back in the 18th and 19th century around you know, relatively small downtown areas. And that still defines them. Most cities in Europe were defined in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance around old walled cities. And you can still see those walls, even though more than half the population of those cities extends beyond them. The problem most cities face, and Detroit is a typical example, is that they have boundaries that don't correspond to the reality of the population they serve, the territory they serve, and the services and jobs that they issue. And the result is one of the things we need to do to put cities on a firmer financial footing is extend their jurisdictional and tax boundaries to encompass the real populations they serve today. And I can give you the example of Detroit. Okay. Uh, I hesitate only because I think when, when we uh, de-amalgamated in, in, in Ontario, in, in southern Ontario and Toronto, and, and the debate, there's many people who would disagree with extending jurisdiction, but we'll leave that for another day. I want to focus in uh, on what's going but on. Can I give you the, ex I'd love to give your... Uh, okay, your, give me uh, the example. Viewers, the, ex the example of Detroit, just because it's so, and this is true in many other parts of the world, and it's true in Italy where they're actually doing what I'm talking about. So I, I think even, I understand the issues of de-aggregation de de and so on in, in Canada, but I, I, I think long term, this is the way to go. And let me give you the Detroit example, because everybody says when I say, let mayors rule the world, cities are great. They say, yeah, what about Detroit? Just the way they say when I talk about mayors, what about Rob Ford? You know, as if every mayor in the world is, is, is Rob Ford. Uh, 
here, but here's the truth about Detroit. It is true that as defined in the early 19th century, in the town limits set back then, Detroit has gone from 1950, where it had two million people and was the fourth largest city in the United States and the home of the entire automobile industry and much of the uh, parts industry that helped the automobile. It was without question one of the most successful cities in the United States of America. And today it's true those two million have dwindled to 700,000. The manufacturing of automobiles has fled downtown Detroit and disappeared, and there's only about 2% of the auto industry is still in downtown Detroit. Half the schools are closed, a lot of the parks are closed, the street lights are out, housing's been abandoned, and the city is, in terms of that 19th century definition of the city, is bankrupt, no doubt. But now, here's the little secret nobody talks about. The 10 suburban counties around Detroit that make up the greater Detroit metro region. Those counties in the same period that Detroit was going from 2 million to 700,000 have gone from 3 million to 5 million. And much of the automobile industry that left Detroit, it didn't go to South Carolina or Mexico, it went to those 10 counties where a lot of Chrysler and Ford and General Motors still have many, many plants. And those 10 counties, having grown in population and grown in manufacturing capacity, have also become the number four domain and district in the United States for new economy, new tech, and the knowledge economy, just after Silicon Valley San Francisco and New York. So the 10 counties around Detroit are a tremendous success. They're flourishing. It's one of the most prosperous parts of the United States. Now, redefine Detroit by those 10 counties, and you've got a very successful greater Detroit metro region with one problem area that it now has the resources to deal with. But define it in the old-fashioned way, despite the fact that the 5 million people in greater Detroit metro region are served by the Detroit Museum, Detroit transportation, Detroit sports teams, jobs, and all kinds of other things, those people are free riders on Detroit's uh, problems. And in effect, you've got a jurisdiction that doesn't work. So in many parts of the world, the old jurisdictions are too narrow. They do not give you access to the tax base, the economic resources that would allow cities redefined on a larger scale to succeed. So redefining, redefining the jurisdiction and tax base of cities is a crucial job for the coming years. Okay. I want to move from talking about, you know, an example of a city in the developed world to, to the developing world. Because you write in your book that 78% yes. of city dwellers in the least developed countries live in ghettos. The math works out to about one out of every six people on planet Earth living in a ghetto. So, Benjamin yes. Barber, would a world governed by cities, would it not just exacerbate this problem? Again, a very important question. And let me say for your viewers who want to see that argument really spelled out, look at the wonderful book the devastating book by Mike Davis called Planet of Slums, in which he talks about, you know, big cities in terms of these vast slums and all the problems. So that's a very real problem. And obviously, if cities are the heart of creativity and entrepreneurship and progress, they're also the heart of inequality and of ghettos. But here's a couple of things. One, the inequalities that cities experience, the slums and the poverty that cities experience, they do not produce. Cities deal with the consequences of a global capitalism they cannot control. So, you know, those are issues of a global market economy, a global capitalist economy, inequalities among and within cities, inequalities of class that stretch across the planet. And mayors and the citizens of cities didn't create those problems. They still have to deal with the consequences. But that's an important point. And that's another reason why you've got to extend the jurisdictional uh, boundaries of cities so that they can go to the larger regions where they can deal with some of these problems. But here's point number two. Given that there's a lot of inequality of cities, I have a question for people who say, oh, cities are all about slums. Why do poor people go to cities? Because today, as yesterday and last year and last century, the biggest influx of immigrants into cities comes from the poor, comes from people who have nothing. They go to cities. Why? They go because despite poverty, despite global inequality, despite a global economic system, global capitalism, the global market system that creates these radical inequalities and often creates a lack of jobs, cities have greater possibility and greater hope even for the very poor 
than where they are living. Mm. So today, people continue to flood into Mumbai and Delhi and Jakarta and, uh, uh, and uh, Rio, cities that have a lot of poverty already. Why are poor people voting with their feet? Because despite the poverty, despite the slums, they see greater possibilities of upward mobility, greater possibilities of creativity and entrepreneurship. In other words, cities by their very nature, their creativity, their entrepreneurship, their possibility, the porous boundaries between slums and non-slums, the informal economy, the squat economy and housing offer possibilities that let poor people find a way forward. So I would argue that those cities by themselves can't cure all the dismal consequences of global inequality that come from an unfair global private market system. They are very good at providing answers at the local level to the problems they didn't create, and that's precisely why poor people go to the city. I mean, a lot of wealthy people say, what are these poor people doing here? They're just making the city poor. But if you look at it from the perspective of the poor people, they see a city of possibility, a city of hope, a city of creativity. And Catherine Boo's wonderful book, Beyond the Beautiful uh, uh, Forevers, about the Mumbai slums is a wonderful book that shows how from the perspective of the kids who work in those slum junkyards, recycling materials and making a living and even finding a way into the middle class, the city is still a place of hope. Mumbai, known as the city of dreams by the migrants that come in and flood in from all over India. You, you, know, you, you touched on this just a second ago, said, look, the cities aren't going to be able to solve all the issues. But I'm wondering, I mean, can cities, especially ones like Mumbai, which are just seeing this influx of poverty from rural areas uh, come into their city, how well equipped, I mean, can they really deal with the growing influx of poor people into, into their municipalities? Well, it's going to be hard, but here's how they have a way forward. We know that in every city in the world that has slums and inequality and vast numbers of poor people, we know that those poor people would vanish overnight if they depended on the formal economy and the formal housing market to live. You know, and yet they're still there. There are 20 million young Egyptians who have college educations and don't have jobs. Now, you'd either, you'd either have permanent revolution or you'd have the extinction of Egypt if there weren't an informal economy. And one of the great strengths of city living and one of the things that attracts poor people and gives them a way forward is the informal economy, the economy of unlicensed vendors, the economy of jobs that aren't officially recognized and maybe are in a gray zone, not fully legal, non-union jobs, housing that is based on squat housing, people living in places that aren't being used but which they don't have a, a legal right to. The informal economy is one of the great hat tricks, if you like, of urban life that allow poor people to not just survive but move forward. And one of the reasons why poor people come uh, to the city, all of the uh, non-licensed taxi services and cab companies that poor people buy a car and start driving, and they don't have a licenses and they pay fines, but nonetheless, they provide transportation and get paid for that transportation. Uh, the informal economy that Hernando de Soto has looked that so carefully around the world is one place where cities excel in finding ways for poor people to find a way forward uh, despite the economic inequalities and the, uh, the problems of the formal economy that keep, keep them out. So uh, the, the cities have a lot of ways of dealing with these things. Also, the borders between slums and non-slums turn out to be much more porous than mm. the models that formal economists have suggest. Because the fact is, uh, a lot of the people who work in the wealthy uh, golf clubs in Mumbai and Delhi come from the ghettos and they're probably not supposed to have jobs there. They don't have the right licenses, but they have the jobs there. Same with the housing market. So we are talking in the city about uh, some things that people would even call corruption you know, the breaking down of formal legal boundaries. But in a very poor city, so-called corruption can be a way in which poor people can bend the rules that rich people don't obey anyway uh, to find a way forward. So there are all sorts of devices, including even a degree of corruption, that allow poor people to find their way forward in cities and allow cities to deal with things. But in the long run, of course, to do so, they will need resources 
to do so, to make better solutions than corruption, better solutions than 12-year-olds uh, working in junk slag heaps to recycle uh, the garbage and make a living that way. They will need resources. And that circles back to the question of cities keeping more of their resources, keeping more of their tax revenues, and having more jurisdiction over the suburbs and exurbs so they can have the resources to create jobs, to create affordable housing, and to do the things that it need, the government needs to do to help the informal economy forward. Okay, I'm glad you, you mentioned corruption because I want to talk about crime and corruption, two afflictions that most cities are, are quite vulnerable for. How much of an obstacle would, would crime and corruption be to, to, to cities, especially let's talk about crime, to taking on a greater leadership role? Well, I would put it this way. The experience that city police departments and city housing authorities and city educational authorities have with crime is actually a terrific experience and a terrific learning curve for dealing with these problems systemically. Uh, the fact is, police chiefs like Ray Kelly in New York, uh, those police forces in Philadelphia and Chicago who learned that zero tolerance of minor crime actually can make an impact on more serious crimes. It's in the city that you have laboratories of not just crime, but of crime fighting and crime prevention. So cities are great laboratories for figuring out how to deal with crime. And of course, we know crime is directly associated uh, with poverty and violent crime is particularly associated with poverty. We also know in cities and indeed in countries, there's a lot of white collar crime, corporate crime that goes unpunished because it doesn't take the form of violence. Nobody gets mugged. Nobody gets murdered. Uh, no drug uh, guy is gunned down in the streets. But that kind of crime uh, is, 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 is equally uh, important. And the fact is that uh, cities are very good at learning about how to deal with crime through housing, through education, even through the kind of housing. We've learned, for example, over bitter experience in 60 or 70 years with the help of people like James Jacobs, that high-rise, project-style housing for the poor encourages anonymity, isolation, fear, and crime. And that low-rise housing facing the street, uh, brownstones in the old ghettos, uh, are a much better bet for curbing crime because, as Jane Jacobs says, it keeps eyes on the street. So there are lots of issues that have to do with crime that we don't necessarily think. We think about drugs, we think about guns and so on. But the nature of housing, the way your streets are laid out, are people out in the streets playing? Are there eyes on the street from windows? Or are there high-rise projects, Le Corbusier style, with big green masses around them that are supposed to be playlands and parklands, but in fact are unoccupiable places for gangs and violence and drugs? And so even how you build the housing, how you lay out your streets, can play a crucial role in whether crime flourishes or whether you keep it under control. Okay, you write in your book about some creative initiatives that citizens have taken on uh, for themselves in cities to improve their situations. And I want you to share one or two of them with us that you think could be helpful in, in other areas. Well, let me take a couple of examples. One is in, <clears throat> I have a long discussion of Los Angeles. It's a good example of the role of the informal economy and the role of so-called illegal or non-licensed street vendors because uh, there's an area just west of downtown Los Angeles called MacArthur Park. And MacArthur Park is an area that is the center of gang warfare among Koreans, Filipinos, blacks, Latinos. Uh, that's an area of Los Angeles that really represents the multi cultural and multi-ethnic part, but through youth gangs that make war on each other. And MacArthur Park and the areas around it uh, were an area that was a real problem. Two things have happened of great interest. One, a community organization called Levitt Pavilions has transformed Levitt Park, which was uninhabitable for ordinary people because the gangs used it as a place to have gang wel welfare. They introduced free concerts and they put on concerts all summer long that made it a neutral territory where the gangs eventually said, no shooting, we all want to go there, our mothers and daughters and uh, friends and need to be there. And MacArthur Park has been pacified and turned into a neutral zone and a zone that people can enjoy through a cultural institution privately funded through civil society, Levitt Pavilions. And right nearby, 
are a series of streets where a lot of so-called illegal vending went on. Uh, the sale of clothes, the sale of various items from carts that were unlicensed. And for a while, the city had the notion, let's license them. But on the way to trying to license them and formalize what was an informal economy, they frightened away a lot of vendors. They started spreading it around to other streets. And the idea of a shopping center, a shopping center, went, center went away. And the result is Los Angeles backed off. And now these somewhat, let's call them uh, non-licensed vendors, that zone has once again become, right next to MacArthur Park, has become a key shopping zone, a kind of peaceful area, an area where civic events happen. Uh, here's a part of Los Angeles people don't talk about, not Santa Monica, not Beverly Hills, not downtown LA, but uh, the MacArthur Park zone with all these Koreans and Filipinos and Latinos and Mexicanos living there who have now found a way towards more peaceful, integration of their young people, a downplay of gang activity, and an upswing of cultural and civic activities that make it more of a truly livable neighborhood, despite the part, fact that it's one of the poorer parts of Los Angeles. So there are people working, not even inside city government, but in the civil society institutions and with the cooperation of government that can change how one big city urban slum neighborhood looks and how it feels to its residents and how it goes from becoming a danger zone to an inviting zone of shopping and entertainment. And what is the lesson in that example other than, look, they've, they've improved their lives. I mean, what is the lesson that other cities can draw from the example you just gave? Well, the city and city government needs to pay attention to the informal economy. It needs to look at the people who are solving these problems themselves, even without government intervention. Uh, there's been studies in Chicago that show in an area of South Chicago where there's been a lot of gang violence, there are a number of areas that don't have it. Why? There's no difference in the money the city spends, but in the areas where there are a lot of informal civic associations run by uh, women of color, uh, crash pads for uh, women from families that are disturbed or have violence in the families, uh, informal after-school programs that uh, mothers will have in their own homes, where you have a neighborhood where there are those kinds of informal civic associations with neighbors looking out for one another and watching one another, those become safer neighborhoods. The people live longer during a period of drought, for example, and heat in the city. Those are areas where because people know each other, they look in on each other and people don't die. In other areas of Chicago where people don't know each other, they live alone in homes, a lot of people die during heat waves in Chicago. So in other words, cities need to honor and encourage the ability of communities themselves to develop their own civic associations, their own informal uh, organizations, and encourage citizens to take responsibility. One of the great things about city government, unlike national, national government tends to say, we will fix it, we will do it. Don't you worry, you can just watch. It treats citizens as spectators. But in the inner city, in downtown areas, in urban North America, and urban Canada, and urban Europe, citizens are participants, not spectators, mm -hmm. in their own civic welfare. They are engaged, they are seen as taking a role either through participatory budgeting or participatory zoning or through civil society. They are actively engaged. A citizen who's fed up with what's going on in a na nation's capital can't do much but curse and complain. But a citizen who's fed up with what's going on in the city can take an active role, can be engaged, can do. This is why one of the reasons Detroit is coming back fast is a lot of old Detroit downtown civic associations and community groups are taking a strong stand and are doing things even in the face of the city's official bankruptcy. So citizens are part of what makes the city. Think of that term, cité and citoyen, city and citizen. Those two things are linked together. Citizens are first of all citizens of their cities and neighborhoods. Benjamin Barber, thank you for joining us over the past two nights about reminding us about what's great about city life and the challenges we face and how we might address those. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.